Take your Bibles and turn with me tonight to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, a very familiar portion of Scripture to each of us. Uh, of course, we know it as the chapter of faith. We've been preaching through a series we've titled Breaking Free, dealing with the bondage that many Christians are in. It doesn't sound possible that Christians would be in bondage, but the fact is, is that many Christians are in bondage, not having the victory in their life that they really ought to have because they many times are, are trying to perform well enough to get God's blessings, and that's not, uh, that's not God's plan. God's plan is, is for us to obey Him, to follow Him, but many times we try to work off of performance instead of the grace of God. And we many times fail to see the work that, we, uh, that God had done in our lives when we got saved, saved by faith through grace. If you would please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to this evening. We're going to begin reading verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, begin reading verse 1, says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 6 is our text that we'll begin with tonight there. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a, re is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I'd like to preach a message of title, Living by Faith, and let's pray. Father, we come to You this evening, Lord, and we understand that there's much that we don't understand. And so therefore, Lord, we ask for the leadership of the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. May we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. May we allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to direct our minds and thoughts even tonight. And may you be glorified. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive me of my sins where I fail you. Sin against you, Lord. I pray that you'd cleanse me and use me, Lord, as a vessel meet for the Master's use. May you be glorified. And Lord, I pray that every heart here would likewise... Confess to you, Lord, that we're weak, that we need cleansing from you, Lord, and that we need to draw an eye to you so that you'll draw an eye to us. Speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. Help us have the right spirit and attitude towards the Word of God and the things of God. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. You know, many of us have computers or at least uh, phones, and most of the phones anymore are the smartphones that you can access uh, the internet or different things. And a lot of people do their banking and even use the, the, uh, uh, the, the pay deal on, on the phone and so forth and use it for a lot of things. And a lot of people keep a, a lot of their information on their computers, their personal information, and because they're working with files and different things at work or maybe filing this uh, for, their, for their taxes or filing this with their insurance companies. And many times they have social security numbers and different things on their phones and and bank account numbers, maybe they do their banking and stuff, and they've got them on their phones, got them on their computers and everything. And in order to keep them safe, many of us, we, we put passwords in. And, of course, like with the uh, bank accounts, they, they roll those passwords over every so often. You have to change the password, and then something else comes up. You've got to change the password, and, and after a while, you've got so many passwords, you, you need a password to your password, and you don't know what you got. And, uh, but you have to have the password to access it, to get to it, to use it. And uh, it's a good thing because it keeps the wrong person from getting your information. And so we, we see that there's a lot of things that we can access uh, if we have the right password with the computer and, and with a phone and so forth. Well, there's a lot available to us in Christ also. 
a lot available to us. And we'll spend eternity enjoying Him, enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding what He did for us. I mean, there's so much there. But the fact is, is that we many times don't realize what we possess in Jesus Christ. And we've dealt with this somewhat in this series already, the fact that we possess all things in Christ and and we have all that, Christ, you know, we're possessing all that Christ has to give to us. I mean, when you got saved, he, he gave it all to you. But the problem is, is that many times we're not accessing it. Many times we don't realize that, hey, listen, there, there's those blessings. And, 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 and in fact, uh, we don't realize that possessing the things of Christ doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to uh, access those things. It means that it's available, but it doesn't mean that we are accessing them, going to them. And the fact is, is I think that we're missing out on the benefits that the Lord has laid down for us through the Word of God and through the things of God. And many Christians live in like paupers because they are not accessing the blessings of God and the things of God and, and the strength of God and the power of God in their lives and, the, and the being able to walk in the Spirit because they are not accessing that. Many are still dragging around the old chains of bondage. And they're settling to be a pauper instead of a child of the king. Going back to the old world. But we have so much. In, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. All things. I, I, would, I would encourage you to underline. If you underline your Bible, I'd encourage you to underline that verse. He says that, uh, according as his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It's available. Those things. Those are possessions. But many people are not accessing them. He goes on and says, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And that's why a lot of Christians are living defeated lives. They don't realize what they've got. Uh, it would be like a... Uh, uh, I remember several years ago down in southeast Missouri where we lived, there was a, a lady and, and um, I think they called her the dog lady or something like that, or cat lady, that's what it was, or something. Anyway, she, said, she lived back up in a holler close to where we lived, and she would go to town. And my wife worked at, at a place called Save a Lot, I believe it was, or something like that. And she would come in there, she'd buy what, hot dogs and something else, just very little. And she mostly bought those for the dogs. And she lived up in this, this place. And come to find out after she died, she had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. And she lived like a pauper. Lived like a pauper. I remember a man that, his name was Mr. Schultz. And I remember him from the time that I was a kid. He lived not far from us. And he lived in an old shack. In an old shack. In fact, I remember some of the neighbors saying they'd go over to check on him once in a while, and they walked in, and they said, you could literally, you could see through the walls. I mean, you could see out, you could see through the walls. And um, said it was not uncommon to go in there, and he would fix a big pot of stew or, or soup generally all the time. He would leave it on the stove. And he said it was not uncommon to go in there and find a raccoon or something eating out of the pot uh, uh, that, he would be eating out, you know, that he would be eating out of, and that's just the way he lived. He had a bicycle. We were a few miles from Piedmont, and he would ride that bicycle to town. And he would ride it back. And, uh, but that's how he lived, Mr. Schultz. When Mr. Schultz died, it was known that he had thousands and thousands upon thousands of dollars. And uh, some of them said that they even knew, that they didn't know where it was, but there was money buried all over that property and stuff that he had. But he lived like a pauper. He had access to so much, but he never accessed it. The lady that lived up in that holler, she had access to so much, and she never accessed it. But what's sadder than that is Christians, who has all that God has promised in the, in the Bible, available, and we never access it. You see, just as there is a password going into your computer or your phone, there's a password to access the blessings and the things of God. You say, well, that's a new one, preacher. No, 
It's one word. It's called faith. By faith, we access the blessings and the possessions that God has laid before us and that we can have that He's laid out in the Word of God. Many times, because Christians in their lives, they do not access what God has for them by faith. They live as paupers. And I'm talking about spiritual paupers. I'm not talking about their finances. They live as spiritual paupers, missing the blessings of God and living defeated lives and not having the victory in their life and and struggling with so many things in their lives because they do not access what God has for them by faith. You say, well, so, okay, we understand that. So faith, we, we, we know somewhat of faith. So let's talk about faith for a second here. And we, we give a definition of faith once before in this, in this series, and, and it's a real simple one. And that, that if, you, if you remember back, the, the, the definition I give you was, was this, acting as if God is telling the truth. It's that simple. Conducting your life as if God is telling the truth. You say, well, well, preacher, he is. I know, but you don't live like that many times. And we need to conduct our lives with that understanding. That God is telling the truth. And so if you conduct your life as though God is telling the truth, then you should have faith in what he can do. You know, we could say that grace gives you what you have, but faith enables you to experience what grace gives you. You have what you have by the grace of God. But it's by faith that you, it, the faith enables you to access or to experience what grace God has given you. And I'm not talking tonight about uh, being saved or saving grace. So right now I'm speaking about faith that undergirds our daily Christian life. Because every one of us are back and forth sometimes. And we need that undergirding by faith so that we can walk uh, by faith and, and not by sight. Many believers don't enjoy or use the blessings of grace to, to an equal degree. There's some you say, say boy, it seems like boy, they're, they're, they access the blessings of God all the time and God's really doing something. Not everybody does that. And the reason is, is that uh, they fail to access it by faith. But it's available to every one of us. The promises of this book and what God has promised you and I is the same uh, throughout the scripture. And, and the difference between one person and another, one that is, is accessing it by faith and trusting what God said in the word of God. And their life is, uh, is turning out a completely different way. Their Christian life has victory in it and they're excited about the things of God. And they're telling people about Christ and, and they're, they're loving the, their relationship with the Lord. And they're excited about the things of God and they're excited about the word of God and they've got a song in their heart and they and they love what the Lord is doing in their lives and then you got a Christian over here that boy they're dragging around and they're they're defeated and they're always up and down like a yo-yo and and they're struggling all the time the difference is is that this person over here is just accessing the same thing that's available to this person over here but they're accessing it by faith and trusting what God said in the word of God said I'm going to take him at his word and do what he says Many times we as Christians, we wind up in bondage and we struggle with things in our lives, the doubts and the fears and the, and the lack of victory because we don't access it by faith. Hebrews 11, 1 there says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith's not some fuzzy concept hanging out there on nothing. It's a real substance. Notice what he says there. Faith is the substance it's a real thing. It's not something fuzzy out here that we think, gonna, you know, and we're just trying to grab it, but we can't get a hold. It's a substance. Hey, I want everybody to, to uh, uh, take your hand right now and, and, and just raise your leg and touch the seat underneath your leg. Would you do that? Just do that. It's there, isn't it? You know what? Not a single one of you has probably did that when you come in before. Probably not a single one of you has got over there and went... You just come and sit down. By faith. 
Do you realize how much faith you use all the time? I mean, all the time. You go to a doctor. He looks you over. He says, stick out your tongue. Stick out your tongue. Man, that's an ugly tongue. Anyway, he, he says, stick it out. Say, ah. Oh. Uh-huh. Let me see this out here. Yep, that's what I thought. <clears throat> and he tells you, you need this pill to care, take care of what you got. He writes you out a prescription. You take it. You go down to the pharmacist. You hand it to the pharmacist. He gives you a little bottle and says, now take this here. He tells you take one of these uh, three times a day and, and, uh, and, and be sure and take all of them. Do not to throw any of it away. Take every one to the last pill. Okay. You go home, what do you do? You do what the, you, you believe what the doctor said by faith. You went to the doctor. You don't know anything about what's going on. You, you trust in him by faith. He wrote out a, a prescription and, give, and gives it to you. You go down to the pharmacist and you're trusting the pharmacist. And by faith, you're taking a pill, sticking it in your mouth and swallowing it three times a day. And you don't even know what's in the thing. You exercise faith all the time. I hate to tell you this, but sometimes I give the wrong pills and people die. But we still go to the pharmacist and we still go to the doctor, don't we? By faith. By faith. And so many times we don't realize that we struggle with trusting what God said. And yet he saved our souls. As I said, it's not a fuzzy thing. It's something that we can put our hand on. Faith is, really. It's the word of God. Faith is, is not that fuzzy concept. It's, it's a substance. We exercise faith in all things. And like I said, in, in one sense, faith isn't the significant issue. The real issue is what you rest your faith in. Because we all rest our faith in something. That's the real issue. What are you really putting your faith in? We're called to believe the revelation of God even when... His truth contradicts what, what we can see and, and touch and feel, aren't we? I mean, there's things that the Bible asks us to do and, and, and to believe that we can't touch it, we can't feel it, we can't see it. Or maybe it contradicts what we see. So we got to choose between what God says and His Word, even when we can't see it and what we can see that looks more true than what God says. So give me an example of that. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, you remember Eve and how that, that she sinned. Let me just read there real quickly. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and said unto the woman, Yea, hath, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Well, we know because we can go back to chapter 2. And she has been instructed that she should not eat of the tree of the, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Everybody remember that? Or do I have to go back and read chapter 2 for you? You remember that, don't you? God told them that, right? God told them that, right? right. Chapter 2. God told them that, right? Okay. So now here she is in chapter 3, and the serpent is questioning what God said. Verse 2 says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. That's what God told her, right? Okay. Okay. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 says, And when the woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. From that very moment, when they ate of that, that fruit of that tree, they began to die. Do exactly what God said would happen. You say, well, how do you know? Well, they're not alive today. That's how I know. They died. And the fact is, is that God told her, and told Adam, don't eat of that tree. 
Do not eat of that tree. In the day that you do, you'll die. And basically what happened, they begin to die. They died spiritually, first of all, but then they begin to divide, die physically. And so now here she is. She looks at the tree. She looks at it and she's thinking, who do I believe? That tree really looks good. And boy, the thought of being wise and knowing good and evil, which I really don't know what evil is, because there never has been evil, but just a thought of knowing something that I don't know sounds pretty good. And boy, I'll tell you what, that, that fruit really looks good, and, to, and I desire to have it. There's something about I just really like to have that. So who does she believe? She believes Satan. See, if she would have believed the Lord by faith and trusted what he said, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. So you see, sometimes God asks us to believe by faith something that we don't look right to us. It, well, it looks like it's okay. It looks, and it seems like that would be a good thing to, to know good and evil. And wouldn't that be a good thing to be like God? And we begin to rationalize with what we see, what we've heard, and what we've touched. When God said, don't eat of that tree. You see, faith comes down to who you believe. Who you believe comes down to, are you going to believe you or are you going to believe God? comes down to, are you going to believe your feelings and your emotions or are you going to believe God? Faith says, believe God. You see, God has given us all the, that we could ever need. And the issue is we're going to believe God concerning what he said. Are we going to believe what he said that he gave us? Are you going to believe what he said? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll see in a minute. You see, faith is important. Hebrews eleven six there says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In order to please God, we need to learn how to, uh, how to exercise faith in order to please God. It's a matter of exercising the faith that he's already given. Hey, listen, we must believe him before he becomes our, our rewarder. If you want the rewards of God, you're going to have to believe him. You're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to have faith in him. He said that if we want to please him, then we must trust him. We must believe him by faith. And he said, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is the reward of them that diligently seek him. And so if we want to please him, we've got to trust him by faith and trust the word of God. When we fail to believe him and trust him, or we fail to, then we fail to please him, and, and many of the blessings are withheld because of our lack of faith. We talked about that before. How come this person over here seems like they got victory and this person over here doesn't? It's a matter of faith and what they're trusting in the word of God and trusting the Lord. By faith. It's not that they're anything special over this person. But it's a matter of faith and that's how they get the victory. When God says something in his word and we don't believe it. And listen closely to what I'm going to say here. When God says something in his word and we don't believe it and we're not willing to trust it. In essence what we're saying is God you're a liar. You see preacher that's awful strong to say it that way. No. In God's word, if we're not willing to by faith take what he says and trust what he says, in essence, what we are saying, God, you're lying. Lord, I sin, and Lord, you said in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, Lord. And I, I, I repent and I ask you to forgive me. You get up from there and you walk away and think, man, I just don't see how God can. 
and you're still beating yourself up over this thing, and 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 you and and, and you go back. I, I've got to pray about this guy, and, and I got to go. And I, you know what you're doing? You're telling God that He's a liar. Oh, preacher, we would never use that type of term. I would never say, "God, you're a liar." You may not say it that way, but you live your life like He's a liar. Give you an example. Romans three twenty three says, "For all have sinned." Right? Okay. Is there anybody in here that has not sinned? Oh no, preacher. The Bible says for all have sinned. Okay. Then uh, in John, or First John chapter one verse ten says, "If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar." That's what the Bible says. And so when we go against what God is telling us in the Word of God, and we're not trusting by faith what He says, we're calling God a liar. Do you know that many times that's where a lot of people struggle with salvation is faith. With their heart, they reach out to God and they ask the Lord to forgive them and they meant it, they repent of their, their sin, they ask the Lord to forgive them. But the problem is, is when the, somewhere in their life they sin and the devil gets on their trail and they begin saying, how could you be saved? How could you be saved? And so they, they begin to struggle with it, and, begin, and the devil keeps beating them up over it, beating up over it, and they, and they get to feel like, I'm not saved. How could I be? You know, you know what? In essence, and not meaning to, but you're calling God a liar. Because he said, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is man salvation. And with your heart, you, you asked him to come in your heart and life and save you, and you meant it. And in and, and, uh, verse, verse 13, he says, For whosoever is called upon him, Lord, shall be saved. Didn't say might be, but said shall be. You see, it's with the heart, it's not the words, it's not all of your things. But I want to tell you something. That's why he gives us provision of 1 John 1 9 that, hey, listen, he knows that we're going to sin, that we need forgiveness and cleansing of that sin. And so basically what we've got to do is by faith, by faith, trust the Word of God, not your feelings. You go back to the facts. You see, the Bible is, is factual. And so you go back to the Bible about your salvation. Am I saved? Okay, well, well let's look at it. What did the Bible say? Okay, yes, I did. do. I, 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 and I meant it with my heart and, and, and I repent. Okay. Then are you going to believe your feelings? Or are you going to believe God? Bottom line. And a lot of Christians struggle back and forth. And it's not that they want to. It's because they are trusting the wrong person. Faith's important. You see, in Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. The focus of your faith is, is vital. We need to get our focus off the, off the Eve's fruit tree that looks good and focus on what the Lord has told us in His Word. Notice there again, it says, when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired, it was, that's feelings and what she's seen, to make one wise. You see, if Satan can get you to focus on your feelings, if he can get us to focus on our five senses, Instead of focusing on God in faith and on His Word, we'll, we'll begin to veer off that road. And before long, we're on, the, we're on the shoulder over here and we're struggling and we're, we're in fear and we're living in spiritual defeat and we wonder why we have no victory. It's because our focus, our faith focus, is not on, on the Lord and not on His Word. And so we become bound up again. And we don't have victory because we're focusing on our feelings. I'm going to tell you something. There's some days I feel great and there's some days I'm like, oh my. Let's start this day over again. Tomorrow. Feelings change all the time. Far too many believers rely on their feelings to define their reality then all that Satan has to do is to keep you off balance, to keep your feelings stirred up, and he'll keep you defeated. Most Christians spend their lives adjusting their faith to match their feelings. 
instead of their feelings being adjusted to match what God has said. Let me say that again. Most Christians, or many Christians, they live their lives, spend their lives adjusting their faith to match their feelings. When we ought to be adjusting our feelings to match what God says in His Word. Because He's truth. You say, well, maybe I just need more faith. Well, do you realize that when you got saved, that God gave you all the faith that you need? The problem is, is that you're not accessing that faith. You're not, it's not growing in you. In Luke chapter 17, we're familiar with the story there. Um, and I'll just read verse 5 and 6. And it says, An apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Okay, increase our faith. It was like this almost saying, give us more faith. Add some more faith. You know, pick it up, pour in some more faith. And Jesus comes back and he says, And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up and by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should, be, and it should, and it should obey you. Well, then basically what you're saying is then that you don't have any faith at all because have you ever looked at a mustard seed? And yet God gave you faith. And what he's saying is, no, it's not the fact that you needed all this extra added in after you got saved. You just need to exercise it and strengthen the faith that you already have. Exercise it and strengthen the faith that I have already given you is what the Lord's saying. He said, and if you'd get a, if you'd strengthen up towards the size of the mustard seed, man, you can tell that sycamore tree to be cast out into the river. He said, you just need to strengthen it. The Lord's not saying that we need more faith added to what we received when we were saved, but that we need to strengthen that faith. Remember, he already gave us everything. We we read that scripture, I'll read it again that we need for life and godliness. He already, he already gave us everything. It's the fact that we're not accessing it by the faith. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of, the, of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to, as His divine power hath given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath, get, that hath called us to glory and virtue. So we need to strengthen that faith by increasing or, in, or strengthening our knowledge of, the, of Jesus Christ, the one that is to be focused on, on the focus of our faith. Many times what it is is that walk that we need with the Lord the, in the Word of God and taking the Word of God and putting it in our hearts, that it will strengthen our faith. Sometimes it's even walking with people who are strong in the faith and it encourages us to trust the Lord as we see them trusting the Lord. But my friend, understand this. As we, hey, we need to make the Word of God a part of, of us, not just reading it, but make it a part of your heart and life and begin to trust it. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so our faith is increased as we get in the Word of God, and as we begin to trust what God, and we look at that and we put our focus on, on what God said and not on our feelings, and not on what we're hearing from the world, and not what we're seeing in the world, and not what we're touching in the world, but what God has said and trusting Him. Knowing to a point, the Word of God, that you trust every word, Somebody once said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, God said it, that settles it. Amen. Whether you believe it or not, it's settled. The fact is, is that you need to believe it and trust the Lord. And then you can begin to access and unlock the promises of God's word uh, all through the scripture and, uh, by faith. We need to set our eyes on the Lord Jesus and His Word and not our feelings. We need to keep our eyes of faith set on the promises of God's Word. Above all, we need to remember that the issue is whom we're going to believe. 
Are you going to believe you? Or are you going to believe God? Are you going to believe the lost world? Are you going to believe God? Are you going to believe what the devil's whispering in your ear trying to get you? Don't, don't make me go back and preach about the battle of, the, of Satan, but we're in a battle. And so Satan's going to whisper in your ear. He said, well, preacher, I'm saved. I know. And he's going to whisper in your ear. And he's going to try to get you off track. Well, how do you know that? Uh, didn't I just read about what he said there in Genesis chapter 3 to Eve? Do you think he's changed? No. He's going to continue to do that. And so we become defeated. We begin to doubt. We need to put our focus not on ourselves, not on our feelings, but on what God said. And trust what God said. And by faith we can access the promises of God. Forgiveness of sin. Joy unspeakable. Peace. Boy, we go on all night. The promises that God's given us. But my friend, you'll only access them by a password called faith. In trusting what God said instead of your feelings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and some goodness to us. I pray now, Lord, that you'd help us to access the promises and the blessings of God and all that you want to do in our lives by faith and trust you. Lord, Satan wants to defeat every Christian in here and he wants to get them to not to have victory in their lives. He wants them to trust their feelings and not them, the word of God and not what you said. Lord, help us to trust your word. Thank you for the promises, the forgiveness, the joy, the peace. And on goes the list of the many blessings and promises of your word. Have your will and way, Lord. It's an invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Maybe tonight you want to just come and say, Lord, help me.